É, é um prazer estar aqui dando continuidade às nossas celebrações do, do aniversário do, do nosso instituto. E a gente com, continua essa semana com uma sequência de, de conferências né, que estão sendo organizadas pelo Programa de Biologia Molecular e Estrutural. Então, a conferência de hoje vai ser apresentada oficialmente, a palestrante será apresentada pelo professor Ulisses, e na próxima semana, na semana que vem, é feriado, dia 28, então a gente excepcionalmente não vai ter essa conferência é, do meio-dia do nosso instituto. E na semana seguinte, dia 4 de novembro, a gente retorna normalmente uma palestra, uma conferência do Rafael Linden. Então, a gente vai ter só essa pequena pausa. É, nessa semana, é, de 3 a 5 de novembro, eu queria anunciar, é, para quem não sabe, né, para lembrar, que a gente vai ter o workshop dos pós-doutores daqui da nossa casa. Então, participem é, concomitantemente as nossas, a nossa conferência no dia 4, vai haver esse evento de 3 a 5, né, um evento é, bem maior. E a última palestra é, do, do Programa de Biologia Molecular e Estrutural vai ocorrer semanalmente numa sexta-feira, dia 13 de novembro, ao meio-dia, né, em função dos horários dos palestrantes. A gente está tendo a oportunidade, é, como a Miriam acertou agora, a gente está fazendo uma limonada com limão. Né? Então, a gente está é, tendo a oportunidade de ter palestrantes né, como hoje, em diversos lugares que a gente tem essa oportunidade porque é online, né? Então é um prazer, professor Ulisses, por favor, apresentar nosso palestrante de hoje oficialmente. Obrigado. Thank you. É, obrigado a todos que estão aí nessa nesse evento, né? Uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. David Wang. Dr. David Wang uh, got his uh, graduation at MIT in uh, biological chemistry, and he did his uh, postdoc in Joseph Deris lab at San Francisco University. Uh, David Wang is a young full professor at Washington University, and uh, he has amazing work on the discovery of new virus and diagnosis, massive diagnosis of virus, and also in interaction and mo development of models of interaction with virus and uh, in different systems. Uh, David Wang, he developed several uh, tools, bioinformatic tools and uh, molecular biology tools in order to uh, characterize and characterize the virus. So it's a pleasure to have you here, Dave. I'm sure everybody will enjoy. At the end, we'll have a uh, discussion, questions. And thank you again, Dave. Please, you can start. All right. Uh, thank you. And thank you to Ulysses for inviting me. And we were just saying that the uh, fringe benefit of the COVID situation is that we can travel internationally very rapidly by Zoom and uh, see old friends and share share lots of interesting science. So I'm going to start presenting. Let me see. Uh, okay. So can everybody see the screen? My title slide here. Yes. Okay. So as Ulysses mentioned, my lab for the last more than 15 years has been focused on ways to discover and then characterize novel viruses. And the reasons we do this are really twofold. One reason is, of course, there's lots of human diseases or animal diseases of unknown origin. And in many cases, these are caused by unknown viruses. And so we want to understand more about the causes of disease. But then secondly, we're also interested in new viruses because viruses are obligate intracellular parasites. They have to survive within the cell without their, all of their own machinery, unlike large parasites like Leishmania and so on, or even bacteria, which encode many functionalities they need. The viruses have to utilize the host machinery. And so 
viruses provide tremendous insight into the normal biological processes. And so we think that highly divergent viruses, new viruses, might teach us about new pathways. And so those are the two major reasons we're interested in these new viruses. So in my lab over the last 15 years, we worked on a large type variety of specimens, including all the ones you can see up here. And um, I won't have time to go through all of them today. I'll focus on two stories. Dr. Wang, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I think that the presentation mode has not entered for us. I'm okay. not sure if it's a problem only of mine. Let me see. Uh, okay, now it's working. Uh, we, we see it as if it, uh, as your PowerPoint being opened, but not as a presentation. I see, okay. Um, is this okay? Because I guess when I go to presentation mode, it doesn't work. Um, is that correct? Um, well, the present, well, it should work for us, but maybe you won't be able to see us. I'm not sure if um, if you tried uh, to put it on the presentation mode and it didn't uh, yeah. okay. engage let me, or... Let, let me try the presentation mode again. And do you see this slide? The the one with the dolphin in it? And We do. We, we see it, but we see it cut because it is as if uh, you're, you have your... Uh, PowerPoint opened, and uh, we see the the row of slides of slides on the left corner, and we see as if you're editing it. I see. It doesn't show when I go to presentation. Uh, let me try one more thing. Uh, it uh, might be depend uh, dependent on how you you shared your screen. If you shared the entire screen, or if you shared only the applic the application, uh, which uh, might should I share the Make entire the screen? I have been doing that. It tends okay, to have see. less interference. And entire I'll take the screen. opportunity to ask people to turn off their videos and to keep the mics off until the end of the talk. And anybody who is logged through the Meet uh, platform can ask their questions directly or I can type them on the messages and we will ask the Dr. Uh, Wang. Oh, now it's perfect. Is this working now? Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank right. you. Great. Sorry about that. So, so in my lab, we work on virus discovery from many different types of specimens. And today, though, I'll focus on the two on the very far right here. We'll look at enteric viruses of humans. And then this is the nematode C. elegans. And I'll come back to that in a minute. So the technologies that we've developed um, over the past two decades focus in essentially on the same starting point, which is we look for nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, of the virus present in whatever specimen we're interested in. And then over the years, the approaches we've taken have varied. When I first met Ulysses uh, almost 20 years ago, at that point in time, I had developed the first pan-viral DNA microarray. And this was a microarray, a glass slide that contained sequences from essentially every known virus, and we have selected highly conserved regions in order to be able to detect novel variants or related viruses. And I won't talk about this today, but in fact, in 2003, um, when I was still in the Derisi lab, we were able to use the microarray to help identify SARS as, uh, the original SARS as a novel coronavirus. Of course, uh, Sequencing has really evolved in the past 15 to 20 years, but we had started in the Sanger sequencing era of also simply randomly cloning nucleic acid molecules present in a sample and doing high throughput Sanger sequencing in order to identify viruses that might be sequences that might be present. And again, I won't talk in great detail today about that, um, but for the young students today who may be not so familiar with high throughput Sanger sequencing. Um, high throughput Sanger sequencing meant that you would do 96 or 384 sequences at a time, um, or even maybe 10 times 384 sequences. And that's what we thought was high throughput sequencing back in, oh, let's say 2003, 2004. Um, but of course then next generation sequencing platforms have evolved and the capacity now has been increasing by many orders of magnitude um, over the years. But the concept of these two methods are the same, and it's that by randomly sequencing nucleic acid molecules, we then computationally analyze them to determine which ones are from the host, 
which ones are from known viruses and which ones have low similarity to known viruses. And those are the ones that we're most interested in. So the novel virus sequences. So um, I'm going to start by talking about some work that we were, we studied about um, human diarrhea. And the reason we were interested in diarrhea back then is that um, and diarrhea was and still is a very significant problem. There's somewhere in excess of 1 million deaths every year. These are mostly children under the age, under age five uh, in developing world. And in terms of the causes of these diseases, there are four major viral causes of diarrhea, and they're listed here. And the year after each name is the year that the virus was first discovered. So in the early 1970s, the major human enteric viruses were discovered. And then subsequently, there have been a number of other viruses implicated, but their contributions are relatively minor or not yet proven. And so despite all this effort, there's, been, there's still about 40% of all diarrhea cases where we have no idea what the causal agent is. So when we started, we applied sequencing and microarray approaches, and this summarizes data from our lab as well as a large number of other labs where by analyzing stool um, and looking for the presence of viruses, many, many novel viruses from different virus families, um, some have RNA virus genomes, some have DNA virus genomes, many novel viruses have been identified. The ones in red and blue are groups of viruses that my lab has discovered or contributed to discovery of. Um, and for the sake of time, though, I'm going to just talk about one group here, the astroviruses listed here, um, to illustrate what can happen or what, what can be done with um, the discovery of a new virus. So what are astroviruses? Astroviruses are small, single-stranded, positive sense RNA viruses. They have a distinctive star-like morphology under electron microscopy. And they basically are one of the four families known to cause diarrhea in humans. It's relatively mild. And what's important is that when we started working on astroviruses, there was only one species of human astrovirus that was known. There are eight closely related subtypes. Another important thing is that astroviruses were assumed to be limited to the gastrointestinal tract. Um, there are no other disease associations outside the gastrointestinal tract. And even viremia for astrovirus had never been described. So no one had seen um, astroviruses in the blood. So <clears throat> this work started with a small outbreak in a daycare center in Virginia in the United States. And there were about two dozen children or teachers who were ill. And they were tested for all known bacteria and enteric viruses, and those were all negative. And there was some fecal samples available. And so this is back in about 2008. So we used 454 sequencing, which was the first platform, uh, on some stool samples from this outbreak. And the result of this was we found a novel astrovirus. Okay. We sequenced the whole genome of the astrovirus, and on this phylogenetic tree, uh, and for those who are not familiar with the trees, basically um, things that are close together on the tree are closely related. So here you can see the closely related human astroviruses. This MLB1 is a different novel astrovirus that we discovered, but the one I want to talk about today is this one that we called VA1, astrovirus VA1, which is highly divergent from the other known human astroviruses. So we found this in multiple samples from this outbreak, suggesting that it might be the causal agent of this particular outbreak, but doesn't prove that. Um, over the years, we found that in fact, they're not just single astroviruses, but there are clusters of astrovirus. So here are the original human one through eight subtypes. We found multiple MLB subtypes. We found multiple VA subtypes. Um, and then, work that we and others did found that by serology that there are high levels of human antibodies against some of these viruses, suggesting that infection with these viruses is relatively common. Okay, so we found a novel virus in an outbreak. We found lots of relatives and other stool samples. There are antibodies to these, so there's human infection. But what are these viruses doing? And so that's a really important question. And so one, one question is, is it a cause of human diarrhea? And in order to prove this, 
Uh, the gold standard is fulfilling Cox postulates, which involves culturing the virus, infecting an animal model, and seeing if the animal develops disease. Um, we can also try to find disease associations by looking at the epidemiology, the prevalence, and the seroepidemiology. Another possibility, though, is that it could be a human pathogen, but maybe it does not cause diarrhea. Maybe it is fecal orally transmitted, but it causes disease in other organ systems. And a great example of this would be, for example, polio. We all know that polio causes paralysis, but polio is shed at very high titers in the stool, and it is fecal orally transmitted. Um, but it doesn't have any kind of uh, gastrointestinal disease associated with it. Okay, another possibility is that it is not, in fact, linked to disease at all. Maybe it's a commensal or a symbiotic part of the GI tract. And we all know now, of course, about the gut microbiome and that we have healthy microbiomes and, and uh, imbalanced, unhealthy microbiomes. And so that's the bacterial populations. And there are, of course, bacteriophages that are key drivers of the microbiome balance. So we know that there must be a healthy bacterial virus uh, virome, um, but could there also be a eukaryotic virus virome? So viruses that are normally there that, that have beneficial effects. And finally, another possibility is this could be simply due to uh, dietary ingestion. That is, could we have just eaten something? The kids could have eaten something that had the virus, and now we're detecting the remaining nucleic acid. So I'm going to tell you about a little bit of work we've done towards both AIMS 1 and 2 here, or our possibilities 1 and 2 here. So starting with number 2, um, interestingly, after we discovered this initial um, astrovirus VA1, there have been a number of independent studies where this virus was found in brain tissue of humans in, who had unexplained encephalitis. And so some of these are transplant pa patients, some have primary immunodeficiency. So the link is that they're all immunodeficient patients. Uh, four out of the five patients died, but all of them had astrovirus VA1 RNA in their brain tissue. Now, this is really intriguing. Um, encephalitis is a huge problem. There's more than 100 viruses that are known to cause encephalitis. But Altogether, we only know the causes of less than 50% of the encephalitis cases. So there's a lot of unknown etiology, and it seems like astrovirus might contribute to this. And now remember, this is surprising because astroviruses were thought to be just GI tract viruses. Um, and no one had ever seen this before, but no one probably had ever looked for astrovirus using targeted assays in CSF or in brain tissue. And it's really only because of unbiased sequencing-based approaches that um, astroviruses have been identified now in the brain. Okay, so what we tried to set out then was, could we try to fulfill Cox postulates for astrovirus VA1 as either a cause of diarrhea or encephalitis? And as I mentioned, to do that, we have to culture the virus or and then try to establish an animal model. And so one of the great things about sequencing is that you can find sequences of many viruses, but then just because you have the sequence doesn't mean that you can grow the virus. And so we spent a long time trying to culture the VA1 astrovirus. Um, and the bottom line is that we were ultimately successful using samples from this original Virginia outbreak. We were able to grow the virus in a number of different cell types. And so what you can see here are multi-step growth curves showing that the amount of viral RNA can increase by three to four logs over 72 to 96 hours in cell types that are permissive, but not in the cell, other cell types, um, like this hamster cell line that doesn't support growth. And we could see uh, viral particles by electron microscopy. And so viruses have this tendency when they're at high concentration in the cytoplasm of cells to form these crystalline lattice arrays. And so you can, hopefully you can see the very ordered crystalline array of viral particles here. So there's some kind of organelle here. Both of them are completely full of viral particles. So this was great. This was the first cell culture system for astrovirus VA1. And so with that, we could start to ask some other questions. Um, and one question was, well, if astrovirus is found in human brain tissues, then presumably it must be able to infect some kind of cell in the central nervous system. And no one had reported for any astrovirus before that it could grow in any type of cell derived from, from neurons or astrocytes. But again, we don't know if anybody ever tried. 
So we tried with the VA1 astrovirus. Um, and just to show you some data here, the, this is uh, primary astrocytes that show uh, increased virus replication, of course, primary neurons don't. And then some immortalized tumor lines derived from um, different types of uh, neuronal cells. Um, some of them are permissive and some are not. Um, but the exciting thing is that we did find examples of central nervous system derived cells that can support infection and replication of the astrovirus. And so this gives us a way now to study in vitro the neurotropism and perhaps neuropathogenesis pathogenic potential. All right, so then we also tried to um, take the next step and to try and fulfill Cox postulates. And that's a place, a step where we're sort of um, at right now. So this is a work in progress. But um, we infected mice, uh, wild type mice, with the cultured VA1 astrovirus. And we analyzed the first the intestine and the brain to look for astrovirus. Because if we expect it to cause diarrhea, it should be in the intestinal tract. If it causes encephalitis, it should be in the brain. And the results were rather disappointing. There's almost no virus detectable in the intestine of these mice. And there's a little tiny bit of virus in the brain. And so that, that was suggestive, but definitely not definitive. Um, but of course, we analyzed all the other tissues from the mice as well. And to our great surprise, we found that there were other organs, the lymph nodes, the liver, but in particular, the heart that had very high levels of viral RNA. So now this was, again, completely surprising that it was in the heart. Um, there's no literature, no association of astroviruses with any kind of heart infection or heart disease. But again, we go back to the bias of the field and the literature and that maybe nobody ever tried to look because if you have a patient with unexplained heart disease, would you look for a virus that's only an enteric virus? And probably not. Um, so that was in wild type mice. We looked in immunocompromised mice. And so here we could see, for example, in RAG knockout mice that lack uh, adaptive immune system, it looks like maybe there's higher level in the brain. So there might still be some kind of brain infection and potentially encephalitic type phenotype. Um, but very clearly, we can see in all of these types of different knockout mice that we get clear and high loads in the heart. So many different types of uh, mice have this heart tropism of the VA1 astrovirus. Uh, and so then we looked at the heart tissues of the mice. And the heart tissues showed in this staining a lot of these blue staining cells here and here. So these are infiltrating immune cells. And it's an uh, indication of a highly inflammatory condition. And this type of histology is characteristic of a disease that's called myocarditis, which is simply inflammation of the heart. And so these mice clearly appear to have myocarditis. Now, in humans, myocarditis is a very significant disease. Um, about 25% of patients with myocarditis are going to die or require a heart transplant. And myocarditis has only about 50% of the etiologies known, and many of those are in fact viruses, but half the cases of myocarditis, we have no idea what causes the infection. And so what we have now is this novel mouse model of myocarditis, and it raises the question that we're trying to answer now by looking at human specimens, um, are astroviruses involved potentially in human myocarditis? Okay, so, what have we learned from this? Um, again, just to take a step back, remember, I told you we were interested in um, looking for novel viruses because we thought they could teach us new things about disease or basic biology. Um, we looked in the diarrhea cohort and we found in this outbreak a novel astrovirus. This astrovirus seems to have very different sequence characteristics, as you saw from the phylogenetic tree. It seems to have very different biological properties because it seems to have a neurotropism and neuropathogenesis based on the human cases that were found. Uh, this underscores that we probably need to look harder for astroviruses in neurological disease. We should probably look harder for astroviruses in myocarditis. Um, and, and so we have gone from thinking that this family of viruses is only a diarrhea virus to uh, a family of viruses that may have many additional potential pathogenic 
um, uh, pathogenic potential. Okay, so now uh, I'm going to change gears and I'm going to tell you about our studies in this model organism, the nematode C. elegans. Um, and so just to refresh everybody's memory, C. elegans is this classic model organism. It has very robust genetics. Um, in three days, we can go from, uh, from, from an egg to sexual maturity. And so this allows genetics to happen, very, genetic crosses to happen very rapidly. There are mutagenesis tools to do forward genetics. There's RNA libraries to do reverse genetics. Um, the worms are transparent, and so you can do live imaging of fluorescently tagged uh, viral protein, or fluorescently tagged proteins. And it's a very simple system. There's about 1,000 cells in the adult, but it has no known adaptive immunity. It has no interferon. So it has some very simplistic type of, and that's poorly defined uh, defense mechanisms. Importantly, about half of the genes are conserved in humans. And many fundamental discoveries in biology have been made in C. elegans, such as the discovery of RNA interference. Um, many labs have studied bacterial pathogens in C. elegans for the last 20 years, but um, no one has ever used this really to study virus infection. And the challenge was because there were no known viruses that people could get to infect C. elegans. So if you took your favorite mammalian virus, um, basically it wouldn't grow in C. elegans and no one knew of any natural viruses of C. elegans. And so years ago, we thought about this problem and decided to try to find a natural virus of C. elegans. And so the reasons that people had not found one could be a couple fold. One could be they weren't using the right approaches. And of course, we thought that we had the best approaches that were available, um, this high throughput sequencing type approaches and microarray approaches. So the other possibility could be that people didn't look in the right place. And so C. elegans has been propagated in many labs throughout the world in petri dishes and handed from lab to lab. And most people, I guess, who have looked have probably tried to look in the laboratory strain. And, but that doesn't seem like the best place for C. elegans to acquire a natural infection. And so what we wanted to do is we wanted to look for viruses in wild C. elegans strains, but not just any old wild strain. We wanted to look in sick looking wild strains of C. elegans. And so how do we do that? So this is akin to, uh, we started our studies of looking for human viruses in patients who had unexplained disease. So we want sick worms. So the way we did this is we collaborated with a worm ecologist in Paris, Marie-Anne Felix. And Marie-Anne Felix um, has discovered that basically rotting fruits in rotting in fruits and orchards are a great place to find C. elegans and its related nematodes. And the reason for that is not because they like the fruits per se, but because the rotting fruits um, are a source of bacteria and C. elegans and its cousins are bacteriovores. So they feed on the bacteria that grow on the rotting fruits. And so what she does is she goes all around the world to collect rotting fruits from different places. She brings the rotting fruits back to her lab, and then she puts the rotting fruit on a Petri dish. And in the middle, she puts a drop of pure E. coli. And eventually what happens is the worms that are in the rotting fruit crawl out and migrate towards this food source right in the middle. And you can see them under the microscope. You can pick them off individually and transfer them to new plates that have only E. coli. And if you do the individuals, C. elegans has a hermaphroditic lifestyle. And so it will reproduce. And so you can isolate clonal lineages of each individual worm. And she studies these for many purposes, including um, population genetics, et cetera. Uh, but what's important for our story is that she's done this for literally thousands and thousands of worms. And she noticed that some small fraction of these worms look sick. So here's our source of sick wild worms. Now, what do we know about the sick worms? Well, she has seen different kinds of sick worms. A lot of them had some morphological phenotype in their intestinal cells, which I won't go into the details. Um, but of course, she tried to cure them by treating with antibiotics, and some of them got better, suggesting that those worms had some kind of bacterial infection. But some of them did not get better with antibiotics. And so she took those, homogenized them, filtered them through a 0.2 micron filter, and then added them to naive worms. And the naive worms 
reproduce this, this morph morphological uh, disease phenotype. And so this suggested that she had a virus, um, but she didn't know what kind of virus. And so we used next generation sequencing on this sick worm filtrate. And long story short is uh, years ago now, we found three novel viruses. One from a wild C. elegans strain that we call Orsay virus from the orchard where it was identified. And then two from wild C. Briggsii strains. And so C. Briggsii is a cousin of C. elegans. And these viruses were from Santoy and LeBlanc. All right. So we did the whole genome sequencing. We did the phylogeny. Um, and it turns out that they are most closely related to notaviruses. So here is a phylogenetic tree of that. So notaviruses are positive sense RNA viruses. There, are, there were two known genera, alpha notaviruses and beta notaviruses. So these infect insects, the betas infect fish. So they're shown here on the tree. These are the, uh, the, these are the insect viruses here. These are the fish viruses up here. And here are our three nematode viruses. Now, they're species-specific, meaning the Orsay virus only infects C. elegans and not C. briggsii, and the C. briggsii infect C. briggsii, but do not infect C. elegans. Um, for the rest of the talk, I'm just going to focus on this Orsay virus and C. elegans. So this was now almost 10 years ago, and so over the in this past decade, we've answered a lot of questions about the biology of Orsay virus. First, we want to know more about the genome organization. Um, we want to know more about the host response. We want to understand the tropism of infection. We've tried to identify host factors that support virus infection, as well as those that are involved in antiviral defense against uh, the virus. And so for the sake of time today, a lot of this work is published in these uh, blue parts here. Um, I'm going to tell you just uh, a subset of the stories. I'm going to talk about the tropism and then how we've been able to use this to identify host factors that are required, not just for virus infection in the worm, but that are conserved in evolution and required in mammals for virus infection. So we'll start with the tropism. Um, so we wanted to really know, because so C. elegans is uh, about a thousand cells, it's differentiated, it has multiple organ systems, there's neurons, there's muscles, there's intestine, and so on. Um, we wanted to know where the infection was occurring, because if you recall, what we started with was we homogenized the entire worm, and then we analyzed and we found the virus. And so in a human... Um, equivalent, this would be the same as doing like a whole body autopsy homogenized at once to find the virus. We know that there's virus in the human, but we don't know in which organ. Um, and so we wanted to, to figure this out. We had some ideas, of course, based on the fact that there's this intestinal cell morphology. Uh, and I'm going to give away the punchline here. So this is a cartoon of C. elegans. And in the 1,000 cells, there are exactly 20 intestinal cells that define the intestine. There are shown like this in 10 pairs of two uh, that oppose each other and they define in the central, uh, the central empty vacuole is basically the, the lumen of the intestine. So we developed antibodies to stain for viral proteins and we stained infected C. elegans. And I'm going to show you some of the pictures that we got. Um, and, and so quite strikingly, um, here are examples of worms where by immunofluorescence against uh, the viral polymerase, we can see essentially one single cell in each of these worms that's staining positive. Um, so that's this rectangular-ish staining. You might be able to see this dark circle in the middle. That's the nucleus where there appears to be no staining, and that's consistent with the viruses of this family are typically cytoplasmic viruses that never enter the nucleus. And so you can see that in many of these cases, we have one cell that's positive. There are also worms, though, where we have two cells that are positive. And so here you can see uh, in this panel two cells that are basically adjacent to each other. Here there's two cells that are opposing each other. And then here you can clearly see there are three cells positive. And so we can walk through this kind of analysis, and we've seen as many as six cells that are positive with our immunostaining. Um, and importantly, these clearly look like they're the intestinal cells, so we think that this is now a nematode simplistic model to study um, enteric virology because this is infection of intestinal cells. Um, 
We can do some confocal microscopy. So here is the viral capsid protein. And if you look here, you can see these clear um, puncta, but then also this very strong staining that seems to line the apical surface of the intestinal cell. This is a monoclonal antibody that binds to a host protein that it has an apical localization along the intestinal cells. And so when you look at this overlay, you can see that uh, clearly there's a lot of virus viral capsid lined up along the intestine here. So this was interesting to us. And in order to um, corroborate this staining pattern, we turned to electron microscopy. And so those are electron microscopy of a cross-section of a worm. And what you can see highlighted in this rectangle here, this is the intestinal lumen. I'm going to zoom in on this. And hopefully you can see basically here are the villi. So this physiologically resembles um, like mammalian intestinal cells. This is the intestinal lumen. And lining the apical surface, you should be able to see some dots, high electron density. If we zoom in higher, you can see, again, these crystalline lattice arrays of viral particles, in this case, lined up very close to the lumen of the intestine. And so we think these are probably the places where the viruses have either assembled or they've now um, uh, transited here to try to egress from the cell in order to spread and then uh, infect other hosts. So we clearly know that the intestinal cells are infected by or say virus. So now I'm going to talk about how, we, how can we leverage the power of this model organism to really understand the host virus interactions. And so can we identify host factors that are important for virus infection? So the key to do this is to do a genetic screen. And the genetic screen that we settled on was um, a virus transcriptional reporter. So that means that uh, upon virus infection, we analyzed host genes. We found a gene that got turned up uh, a thousandfold by virus infection. And we linked that promoter to GFP. So we have a GFP reporter worm where in the absence of virus, it's off. But basically after we have virus infection, 100% of the worms turn green. And so this is our reporter worm. So with that now, we can use the classic tools of chemical mutagenesis for forward genetics. And so the idea here is that we have the starter worm, this, this reporter worm strain, we can mutagenize it randomly with a chemical, uh, in this case, EMS. And so this randomly introduces deletions and mutations in uh, the host genome. And then we can challenge with virus. What we expect is that the vast majority of the worms still turn green but a very small fraction have now mutated in some gene that's critical for virus infection. It now doesn't support virus infection and doesn't turn green. And so we can identify these worms that are off. We can confirm that there's no virus replication in them by, by PCR. And then we can do sequencing and mapping to find the mutation. Okay. And so um, we call it, these, these mutants are going to be, uh, we're, we're looking for the GFP off mutations. Um, so our initial screen, we found three mutations. These are what we call viral virus induced reporter off. Um, and so here's what they look like. So in the absence of any virus, these are all off. The control, the unmutagenized parent, once we challenge with virus, turns green. These other ones fail to turn green. Now I forgot to mention to you that um, this reporter is also activated by uh, another type of parasite, a microsporidia, which is a, a eukaryotic fungal type pathogen. And that can still turn the reporter green in all the strains. And so what that tells us is that these mutants have some very specific defect related to virus-induced uh, GFP expression. And they didn't simply just lose the GFP cassette, for example, in which case they would also fail to turn on with the microsporidia. So we have a virus-specific defect. We quantified the viral load in these mutants, and you can see in these first two, we have very low virus load compared to the immunogenized control. So we're just going to focus on these mutants. So this first one, we went through uh, extensive studies to map and identify what we thought was the candidate gene. Um, we identified a C. elegans gene called SID3 as the ca lead candidate in viral one. We were able to validate this with a number of different experimental studies. 
Um, but what is SID3? SID3 is a cytoplasmic tyrosine kinase. Only one study had analyzed it in worms and basically is important for uh, endosomal import of, of small RNAs. We proved that SID3 is the causal gene, as I mentioned, through a number of different experiments. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll just give you one example in the next slide. So uh, what we can do in worms is we can add back in wild type SID3 um, into the mutant in order to try and rescue the phenotype. So this is similar in uh, cell culture. If you have a knockout, you can add back in the gene by transfection to rescue. So we can micro-inject plasmids into the worms. And so when we have uh, this viral one mutant, if we add back in wild type SID3, what we find is that we can restore the GFP phenotype. Uh, in addition, if we look at the viral load, here's the parent, here's the viral one. If we add wild type SID3 SID back in, we can rescue the replication defect. So this told us that SID3 was the gene responsible for this mutation. Now, this was a kinase. And so with the wild type version of the kinase, we were able to do this. We then mutagenized the um, plasmid so to abolish a key residue that should knock out the kinase activity. And what we found is that this theoretically kinase dead mutant failed to rescue this, um, both by GFP <clears throat> and by viral load. And so what this suggests to us is that the kinase activity of SID3 is required for virus infection. Right. Okay, so <clears throat> this was great. We knew that we identified a gene in the worm that's critical for or say virus infection. It's a kinase. We know the kinase activity is important. But does this extend more broadly in evolution? And I told you that half of the genes in worms have a human ortholog. And it turns out that SID3 does have a human ortholog. The human ortholog of SID3 is a gene called ACK1 or TNK2. It's an activated CDC42 kinase. It's been very well studied in the context of cancer, particularly prostate cancer. Um, it's been studied biochemically. They know that as a kinase, it can phosphorylate a lot of different proteins. Again, relevant to prostate cancer, it, it um, phosphorylates androgen receptor. Um, <clears throat> but importantly, no one has actually studied SID3 in any role relative to viruses. And I go back to the very, very beginning of my talk where I said, well, one of the reasons we wanted to study new viruses is because we thought that novel viruses could teach us very different things that we didn't already know. If we went through and studied novel viruses and all they did was gave us back the exact same genes that we already knew about and other people were studying, then we haven't really learned anything new. Um, but here, we're now finding genes that are important, um, potentially, that uh, no one has studied in the context of virus infection. So what we did then is to analyze the mammalian cells, we used CRISPR to knock out this TNK2 gene in a number of cell lines and tested with um, a variety of mammalian viruses. And we had to test a variety of viruses because the Orsay virus doesn't infect any mammalian cells. And there's really no virus in the family of notaviruses that is a uh, established mammalian virus. So we had to look at viruses in other families. And so after a lot of screening, we found that um, in fact, there are many, many picornaviruses uh, that rely on this TNK2 gene. So EMCV is encephalomyocarditis virus. It's a picornavirus that primarily infects rodents, um, but it's a model picornavirus. And so here we've knocked out TNK2 in A549 cells, and you can see in the knockout, we get 90% reduction of virus infection at an early time point. If we look at this multi-step growth curve, you can see three to four log reduction in virus in the knockout. It turns out that um, all the viruses that we've, we tested in um, the Picorna virus family, including things like polio, Coxsackie virus, enterovirus D68, all have dependency on TNK2. The degree varies anywhere from one to four logs. Um, but they all seem to be dependent. And we tested a large number of viruses in other families, things like chikungunya virus, uh, herpes virus, adenovirus. Um, but none of these other viruses in other families seem to rely on TNK2. Still, this was really exciting that this is the first evidence that you can use an experimental system in worms to find some biology that's relevant 
in vivo, uh, relevant in, in the mammalian context as well. Okay, so this was super exciting, but remember that was the first mutant. We had another mutant here, Baro2, and what was that? So we did the same thing, we mapped that, and it came out with this ID BO280.13. So this means that this is a gene in C. elegans that no one has ever studied in C. elegans, so it hasn't been named yet. Um, it does have an annotation, which is an ortholog of something called human Wiscott Aldrich syndrome protein. This is a protein that um, is a modulator of actin polymerization, so it's involved somehow in actin mediated processes. Um, I'm not going to go through the detail because it's all published, but we validated that this is the causal gene um, by all the same methods as before. And but most critically, um, what's interesting is you remember that. TNK2 is a kinase, and I said it has many well-characterized substrates. So in mammalian cells, TNK2 phosphorylates the mammalian wasp. And so what we found now here in C. elegans on our genetic screen is uh, a kinase and a kinase substrate, or actually the orthologs of such. So let's just clarify what we know. So in humans, this TNK2 gene phosphorylates wasp, and that leads to increased actin polymerization. In our genetic screen, we found the worm ortholog of TNK2. We found the worm ortholog of WASP. We don't know if this kinase actually functions to phosphorylate WASP or, and or other substrates. We don't know if in worms this has increased actin polymerization or not. Um, we have demonstrated that in the mammalian cells, TNK2 is important. So now is WASP important? So we did the same thing as before. We did the knockouts, we challenged with EMCV, and again, you can see a reduction, not quite as robust, in the single-step curve. In the multi-step curve, we get a still two to three log decrease, not quite as much as with TNK2. But this was really exciting because this tells us that WASP has an evolutionary conserved function as well, but that now we have a whole pathway of a kinase and the kinase substrate that's been evolutionarily conserved from worms to mammals. Okay, so then the last thing that I wanted to do is to tell you, okay, so this is true in cell culture, um, but what happens in vivo in mammals? And so we made a knockout mouse of TNK2, and then we challenged that with EMCV. And what you can see here is that um, the TNK2 knockout mouse here has much better survival, is less sensitive to infection than the wild type. And so this recapitulates what we saw in cell culture. It recapitulates the phenotype we see with Orsay virus and C. elegans. And so again, that CID3 and TNK2's function to support virus infection in vivo has been evolutionarily conserved from worms to mice. All right. So um, the conclusions from this part is that uh, I showed you how we've now gone from the discovery of the first virus of C. elegans to establish an experimental model to really probe functional virus host interactions. This identified through evolutionary conservation, novel functions in mammalian cells for TNK2 and WASP, and that it is quite possible to use this system to find evolutionary conserved functions. And in fact, I won't, I didn't talk about this, but um, in a paper that we published a couple of years ago with Eric Miska's lab, we identify a novel antiviral function in worms that also seems to work in mammals. Um, that's a, a terminal uridyl transferase. Um, but the concept is clear. We also have done now a number of other genetic screens to find additional host factors that are conserved in this way. So then with that, um, I have to thank the people in my lab who have done all this work. Uh, most of the work on the astrovirus in the beginning was done by Andrew Janoski. The work on the uh, C. elegans has been done primarily by Hong Bing, Christian, and Luis. Um, we have a lot of collaborators for different aspects of this project funding. Uh, and if any of this type of work interests anyone, I am uh, looking for postdocs. And so with that, um, I am happy to take any questions. Um, I'm going to stop presenting now, and I think I can come back. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, David. That uh, was a fantastic talk. And uh, I don't know, I think that the coordination, they organized the question, how, how it's going to, to work. Uh, Ulysses? Uh, yes. Se você quiser 
continuar a conversar alguma coisa com ele. Se tiver alguma coisa do YouTube, eu te passo. Perfeito? Ok. Ok. Eu estou olhando o YouTube aqui. Por enquanto, só recados. É... Ok. Ok. Any questions? I have a question um, because um, well, thank you so much, you know, for the excellent um, talk that you gave us. I, I was just wondering if there is a connection between the astrovirus story and the second part of your story. In other, in other ways, um, for example, the uh, myocarditis model, the experiment that you have done was the astrovirus. Um, do you think that the TNK2 uh, and the WASP pathway uh, could be involved or these are totally unrelated stories? Because I, I lost the introduction of your talk, so maybe I, I, I missed the key information. Yeah, yeah no, they're, they're just two totally different stories. Okay. Um, so we did, in fact, try to test to see if astroviruses rely on TNK2, but they, they do not. So the TNK2 gene seems to be important for every picornavirus that we've tested. Um, but uh, yeah, but the, the stories are totally different. Uh, at the beginning, I said I would tell you about two different stories of uh, finding new viruses and where they would take us. And the astrovirus took us from the enteric tract to uh, neuro disease and cardiac disease. And then the first C. elegans virus has taken us to uh, some pathway that seems to be also conserved and important for picornaviruses. But so far, those two stories are, are, not, are not linked um, at this point in time. Okay, so I'm, I'm sorry I missed that. But anyway, concerning the astrovirus, the first part of the story is the virus uh, leads to chronic infection in the mouse model, or this is just a transient infection? Um, I yeah, mean, how does immunity a, uh, functions, adaptive immunity in relation to uh, that particular model? Because as you mentioned, there are so many myocarditis in humans that people don't know anything about. So, uh, right. it, yeah, so that's a good question. So. Um, we don't have all the answers to that yet, but so far in the mice that we have looked at, it seems to be more of a transient infection. So we can see the virus at like day seven, but at later time points like day 21 or 28, the virus seems to be gone. Um, we've been looking for the infiltrates and they do seem to be a little bit later than the, the peak of the infection, but we need to do this more, we need to take more time points and more systematically to see exactly when the peak is. But like the the, the classic models of, of myocarditis in mice are Coxsackie virus, and some of these have very late um, time points, but it depends on genetic background of the mouse. So we're also looking, um, all this was in black six, we're also looking at other types of mice. So there's a lot of variables for us to explore on this. So um, it's probably still very early to say. And then I think your other point was about immune response. And again, we're, we're starting to explore that by looking at the different knockout mice, um, but we don't have a, a extraordinarily clear picture right now. Um, there doesn't seem to be huge effects there are modest increases when we knock out, for example, uh, RAG. Um, so, so we still have a lot of work to do to really establish the, the parameters for this model. But we're just really excited because no one thought that astrovirus has anything to do with heart disease. And, and so it seems clear that it does. What about oral mucosa? Um, is it susceptible to this virus or not? Or to this class of viruses? The oral mucosa, so yeah. you would mean like uh, oral swabs or tissue biopsies from, right. from right. the mouth or the trachea. Um, yeah. Associations so, with periodontitis, for example, because there are, there are many, you know, associations between periodontal disease and development of myocarditis. So 
Yeah, uh, um, that's a good question. We haven't looked. Um, I'm not sure in the mice that we sampled the oral cavity. Um, I'm sure we did the trachea, but I or but I'm not sure that we did uh, the mouth or or any mouth lining. We we we. we focus more on organs, um, but that's a really good thought. And then in humans, we haven't looked at all. And for sure, that's something that, uh, um, that should be looked at. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Okay. Van? Yes. Uh, from YouTube, Tatiana asks, uh, do you have any idea about the step of virus infection? That SID3, I don't know if the, the name is correct. Yeah, C3. Pathway, yes. uh, C3. Uh, pathway is, is, important, is important for entry replication. Yes. So we do have some idea. We have some data. Um, I didn't have time to go over it, but um, basically, we know that it happens, it's important at a pre replication step of the life cycle. It's most likely entry, uh, some, some, some aspect of entry. And the reason we know that is we have generated a reverse genetics for Orse virus. And so we can initiate virus replication from a plasmid, an endogenous plasmid. And if we do virus replication from an endogenous plasmid in the SID3 mutant, that replication is the same as, the wild, as in the wild type. So SID3 doesn't affect replication from a transgene, so it must be something before replication. Um, and we have some data in the mammalian cells from the TNK2 that there's a defect in internalization for the picornavirus. So we, we suspect it's an entry pathway um, process. Dr. Wing, would you mind uh, in, uh, finishing or ending your presentation such that we can better see uh, when the oh. discussion happens? Because right now we... Yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay. Uh, another question. Uh, based on your work on discovery of new virus, how do you approach classifying virus in new species? Sorry, how do I what? Uh, I'm sorry, I, I can repeat. Uh, based on your work on the discovery of new viruses, how do you approach classifying viruses in new species? Oh, I see. How do we classify the new virus? Yeah. So, um, right. So basically, we look for viruses and we get a quantitative measure of how different it is. So, for example, we compare the sequence of the polymerase to the known relatives. Um, but then the classification really falls to this international group, the International Committee for Taxonomy of Viruses. And for every family, they have different guidelines and rules based on the known properties and diversity of that family. And so basically, we rely on them in a way to tell us, okay, this is a new species, or this is a new genus, or this could be a new family. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, that, that, that it, it, that's about naming, and, and we need to be we need to be consistent with other people. Um, but the thing we care about the most is just how different is it, and something that's you know only shares thirty or forty percent similarity is something that's going to be pretty different. Whether in one family it could be a new genus, whereas in another one it might only be a new species. Um, but classification is actually quite challenging. Um, and, and there are people who spend a lot of time uh, trying for the for the good of the community to help systematize that. Oops, thank you. Uh, from YouTube, also Atilio asks, uh, I was wondering how the loss of TNK two. I don't know if the name is this a TNK two, uh, and the downstream wasp might actually affect viral uh, replication. Also, uh, once the phenotype of the TNK2, KO mice, I don't know the name. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, it's TNK2, that's fine. Um, okay. Right, so the TNK2 knockout mice basically have no phenotype, that no obvious phenotype um, in terms of like viability or anything like that. Um, 
There is the resistance to virus infection compared to the wild type. And the first part of the question is, is it about the mechanism? Um, how does loss of TNK2 and WASP affect the virus? So we think that it reduces virus entry. Um, and so therefore you have, it's not an absolute block. So it probably has alternative ways to get in because um, we don't get zero infection. We, we do get infection and eventually it does catch up So um, from our multi-step growth curves. So we think it's an important factor in, um, again, in entry and infection. Um, but it's not an absolute, it's not like you've lost, knocked out the receptor and now the cell is completely um, refractory to infection. Thank you. And another question is, have you looked at the four co-infection of SARS-CPV2 and atrovirus in COVID-19 necropsy samples? Um, so, no, we haven't, we haven't worked with any, uh, sorry, so SARS-CoV-2 and astrovirus in, in humans or in mouse? I'm not sure what the question uh, is. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, um, but the answer is no. We haven't done anything looking for astrovirus and SARS-CoV-2. Astrovirus in the human population um, by PCR is relatively rare, so it seems pretty. It would be very hard to find that and um, SARS-CoV-2. There are some school reports of SARS-CoV-2 in stool. True. Um, so if that was the question, um, we we haven't looked. Um, but I heard necropsy, so I suspect the question may be about animals and not humans. Um, if it's not clear, please ask the question again. So, Thank you, David. Uh, Alexandre from YouTube also. Have you tried a TNK2 inhibitor uh, to assess with the, whether it reproduces the TNK2 knot effect? Yes. Um, so it's a good question. So TNK2 is a kinase and people have developed small molecule drugs to inhibit TNK2. Um, there is one that we have tested successfully called AIM-100, which is reportedly one of the most specific inhibitors that the problem with all the drugs is that they affect multiple kinases, even though they're thought to be specific. Um, but the AIM-100 is fairly selective for TNK2. And in cell culture, we find that we can inhibit virus infection with AIM-100. Um, it's very difficult to do that, though, in vivo with the knockout because the solubility of the AIM-100 is poor. And so we can't get enough of it into a mouse to actually see if it mimics the, the mouse phenotype. But in cell culture, we, we do get inhibition. Okay, David, thank you. Uh, more questions? Any questions here? Uh, may, I, may I ask? Hi, uh, David. Uh, yes. One question related to uh, the astrovirus V1. It is uh, how fast that evolves if there is uh, any implication in different uh, tropes and capacity. Uh, sorry, the question is how fast? How fast the VA one evolve? How fast does it evolve? So, so that uh, there is a subtypes already. It is a clad or it's high. Yes. Organism. So well, and there we is know. Uh, question related to uh, different tropics. Yeah. So we've identified VA one, two, three, four, and even a VA five. Um, so we know that there are variants of VA one. We don't know though. We don't have like a molecular clock calculation or okay. evolution because these are just from different patient samples in different places across the world. Um, so, so we would expect it's probably like any other positive strand RNA virus, um, but we don't have, I don't have any particular insight and we, we haven't done any like uh, laboratory culture molecular evolution studies to try to look at the mutation rate. Um, so so, okay. so I don't have any data on that, but I would guess it would be no different than the regular RNA virus. Okay. okay. And, and uh, another question is, uh, you think this uh, C. elegans model could be a platform for drug discovery, like antiviral testing? 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, people have people have been using it as a platform for small molecule screening for other purposes. Um, you know, there's all kinds of models. There's infection models. There's um, there's like amyloid models and um, other kinds of things people use it for. And uh, other people have been utilizing small molecule library screening in the context of worms. So we haven't pursued that yet, but um, but that's something that we could consider down the road. Okay. Thank you. Um, more questions? If you want to open your camera. No? Yeah. Hello. Yes. I would like to make a question. So thank you very much for your talk. Um, I would like to ask about the VA1. Um, uh, so rag knockout mice, they are resistant to the, they, do they die from infection or no? Yeah, so unfortunately, none of the none of the mice die. So the wild type mice don't die, and the knockout none of the immunodeficient mice die either. The only phenotypes we really see are the slight increase in viral RNA, and then um, the the cellular infiltrates in the heart tissue are are present. But but we don't really get more severe. We don't get dramatically more severe disease. Okay. Okay, so you have well, the next question was that exactly. So you you do have um, an innate cell infiltrate in the in the myocardium of the rag knockout mice. Yes. Okay. Oh no, sorry, sorry. Uh, in the rag knockout mice, I am. We get it in the stat and in we get it in the stat knockout mice, but I actually don't think we get it in the rag knockout mice. I'm sorry. Yeah. No. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Any questions here? No? Okay. Well, many thanks again uh, for your excellent and amazing talk, Dr. Wang. And Thank you for having me. <laughs> okay. And now in, in Portuguese, I'm sorry. É, na próxima semana, é, nós nos veremos aqui, na próxima semana não, é feriado, na outra, né, daqui a duas semanas, a gente se encontra na palestra do Rafael Linden, dia 4 de novembro. Um abraço e declaro oficialmente encerrada a nossa conferência de hoje. Muito obrigada pela audiência. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. All right.